So hi everyone. Uh, after a bit uh, of a break, uh, it is my pleasure to be here again and talk to uh, a brain trip uh, CTO uh, Yuri Drao and a, a friend, I would say, if uh, Yuri doesn't disagree. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to host you and uh, to have this talk. Uh, well, thank you, Ivan. Uh, thank you for the nice invite. The friendship is definitely uh, shared. Uh, it's it's early morning here in Ljubljana, and we're used to having a late morning start. So I hope I'm awake for this interview. <laughs> well, I'm not so far, so it's early morning here in Belgrade as well. So let's just I hope we will um, stay vigilant <laughs> as during daytime. So. Uh, for people who don't know you, uh, can you tell something about yourself and how you ended up in the world of EG? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. Actually, I, I, I come more from the medical field, so I, I, I studied medicine. Um, and I realized during my, my studies that I'm, I'm being drawn towards the brain, not, not necessarily physically, but uh, psychically, which is, which is worse. Uh, and I, I um, applied for a, for a random job uh, looking for medical students to do a bit of programming. And I always liked doing programming, and this was back in 2003, so it's ancient history now. Uh, and and I, I got this job at a small institute here in Ljubljana that had just purchased a brand new EEG. It was a a 128 channel EEG meant for research. And I had this, op uh, this wonderful opportunity to basically get acquainted with this technology uh, from day one, uh, from, the, the, from unboxing onward. Uh, and uh, it always seemed a bit miraculous even that a, a fairly small device, you know, it weighs maybe a kilo or something, uh, doesn't emit any radiation, is very innocuous, non-invasive, doesn't hurt you, doesn't put any needles inside of you, and yet is able to do the most detailed studies of the brain, which is a fairly sensitive organ. It's very delicate, right? It's protected by the skull, but it's the home of, you know, everything people hold dear, of intelligence, of consciousness, of, of feelings and thoughts and, and, uh, and ideas and memories. And I, I always thought it somewhat miraculous that you're able to crack open, virtually of course, or metaphorically, the, uh, the skull using a fairly inexpensive, comparatively speaking of course, and fairly um, um, non-invasive device. Um, but it, from the beginning, it didn't seem trivial. It seemed mysterious because when you look at what an EEG device does, basically it produces a bunch of squiggly lines back in the day on pieces of paper even. And people would, you know, stroll through these pieces of paper, looking at these squiggly lines, magically figuring out what's going on in somebody's head, which seems a bit questionable, right? People would say that's odd, right? How, how are you able to do that? Well, maybe these people have, you know, uh, a deep insight into these squiggly lines. And I, I always wanted to know what the deep insight was. Uh, but at a, point, at a certain point, I realized that what the, what the medical profession does and what the neuroscientific profession does is quite distinct. Uh, they're, all, uh, they're both very good at what they do, but they do it in radically different ways. So the, the medical profession looks at these squiggly lines as an extremely well-trained pattern recognizer. They look at the squiggly lines and they can immediately tell, oh, what kind of epilepsy is this? Where in the brain is it being generated? What kind of consequences will it have for the patient? Uh, what do you need to tell the neurosurgeon to, to create some kind of radical improvement in the patient's life? So, but they do it by way of pattern recognition. Uh, and the neuroscientific field uh, doesn't do it that way. They rarely look at the raw EEG signal, trying to interpret it uh, by way of uh, recognizing certain distinct wave patterns in these signals. They use math and analysis. They, they 
rarely use their eyes, <laughs> except when they're looking at the final plots, right? But they rely more on, on, their, in, uh, on, on their mathematical ability uh, rather than their visual acuity and their pattern recognition, which seemed interesting to me. And I always wanted to know why such a radical distinction exists in these two fields. And uh, I still don't have a good answer, honestly. But what I do now is an attempt to bridge the gap in a, a modest way to uh, perhaps bring these two distinct disciplines closer together and uh, not necessarily, and this is my, my big sin, right? Not, not necessarily by way of bringing the classical visual inspection medical view into neuroscience, but the other way around. They're going to bring a bit more mathematics into, into the way medicine looks at EEG signals. Uh, and without uh, telling too much from, from my end, can, can you tell how, uh, how and what you are doing now and you, how you ended up there? Well, uh, I, um, I always thought that the the right way to approach things is by way of quantitative analysis uh, and kind of scientific way of looking at things. And uh, that's why also, honestly, I, I uh, in a way, I distanced myself from clinical medicine. So I did study medicine, but I, I don't practice as a medical doctor, right? I don't consider myself a medical doctor. So I, 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 I studied medicine, but I turned away from clinical practice er early on. I, I, I never um, found deep resonances in the way um, certain um, uh, medical training is performed and the way I think. That's not to say that the medical training is not performed in an excellent, in an optimal way for the job at hand. Of course not. Uh, medical training is perfectly almost suited to how doctors need to think in day-to-day -day clinic, uh, clinical practice. And I admire clinicians very much in their ability to basically uh, smell diseases, quote unquote. They, uh, 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 an old neurological, um, uh, an old neurology professor once told me that a good neurologist uh, can see Parkinson's disease even before the patient has sat down in a chair next to them. And I always admired that kind of pattern recognition and, and brilliance. But somehow my brain doesn't quite work that way. My brain is more analytical and I, I, uh, I like to approach things from a distance. I like to collect the data, do the analysis and take months and months of time to think about them. And that's not good when you're in the ER and, and uh, there's blood all over the place. And if you say, oh, no, I want to plot the graphs and the plots now and do the math, that's not a good approach. But it is a good approach when you're trying to develop a new medical technology. And that's why I, I transitioned from, uh, from pure medicine, which is where I started my studies, uh, towards neuroscience, towards research. And I think my brain resonates much more with this, with this field. But at the same time, of course, uh, my end goal is to provide a new tool for physicians, uh, for doctors, for psychiatrists and psychologists. Uh, sometimes there's this great worry that a new tool might in a way replace um, a profession, which I think is a very misplaced concern. Uh, calculators didn't replace mathematicians and they never will, <laughs> honestly. There will always be mathematicians uh, for the foreseeable future, I'm certain. And there will always be a need for expert physicians, expert neurologists and psychiatrists, even though they are actually better at their job because we provide them with new and improved tools, which make their jobs easier. They, it, it makes their job faster. And at the end of the day, it improves the lives of patients, which is what we all want. Yes, indeed, uh, there, there is a number of topics that you mentioned that I found find interesting. Uh, so you found that you co-founded the Brain Trip, the company that you work in now, uh, that is uh, in the field of dementia. Uh, 
and uh, this is very interesting uh, also as a field but uh, out of this entire scope uh, if I may ask why dementia <laughs> if you can remember of course <laughs> oh no I, I my memory does work <laughs> still uh, um, uh, the the reason that dementia is in the in the bullseye for our company is quite simple um, when we started thinking about how best to apply our neuroscience knowledge, our expertise to advance the field of medicine, to build new tools for physicians and uh, uh, psychiatrists and uh, psychologists, we asked ourselves, so how can we make the biggest impact in the shortest time most reliably? Well, the, it's, it's a difficult question, right? But it, it, it helps you answer it if you say, well, the biggest impact is probably in a disease or in a field that has the weakest diagnostic capabilities currently. And the disease should also be very common uh, because then you help the greatest number of people. And the disease should also be something that requires maybe early detection. Uh, because that's where new diagnostic technology usually shines best. And the, the field should be something that currently, that currently doesn't have um, non-invasive, easy to use, easy to understand methods supporting it. And when you go down the list of most common diseases of the brain, uh, number one is migraine, actually. The most common neurological disease is actually migraine. Migraine is not a good target, honestly, for us, because it's easy to diagnose, fairly easy. You ask a person, does you know, then they give, give you a list of symptoms, and then maybe you do a bit of examination and so on, but, you know, that wasn't a good target. The next target is, um, is the next most common one is strokes, actually. Strokes, uh, which... The uh, cardiovascular people can argue with neurologists whether this is a neurological disorder or is a cardiovascular disorder, but nevertheless, strokes also has a very good underpinning of diagnostic technology behind it, and it's not a good target for us. Um, and then there's dementia, number three on the list of most common. And in terms of uh, pr uh, uh, prevalence, uh, it's might not even be number three, might be number two. How so prevalent it is? Uh, it is, in general. it is globally, the prevalence of dementia is about 55 million people. And that's probably a conservative estimate. The a more realistic estimate is probably closer to maybe 80 or 90 million people. And that's simply because of the fact that, of course, if you're not looking for a disease, you don't find it. And dementia is a disease that most countries don't systematically look for. Actually, very, very few countries do. There are a few exceptions, like South Korea. They have a national early dementia screening program instigated 10 years ago. But they're one of the few exceptions that have recognized the need for this. And this is in spite of the fact that the World Health Organization is calling dementia the uh, looming global problem of the 21st century. So 55 million people globally, conservatively, and about five to 10 million new cases per year. Uh, that's, these are big numbers. And I'll give you another big number. It can be rounded up to a trillion euros. And that's the combined economic cost of dementia globally. Uh, most of this cost is not due to treatment, as is for most diseases, right? If you look at the cost for cancer, most of the cost goes towards actual treatment. But in dementia, something like 80 to 90 percent of the cost of dementia goes towards um, these inadvertent, these indirect costs. So not the costs of treatments, but the costs of lost productivity, the, the negative consequences it has on families for those people who get dementia, their children, their relatives, and, and so on. So dementia costs us, the planet, a trillion euros a year. And that's economically as much as all cancers combined. It's a, it's a tremendous burden. That's I, I did, you know, even though we know each other, I, I couldn't picture that uh, 
the cost was uh, was such that that you now describe. Yeah, these these numbers come from the World Alzheimer's Report uh, put out by the World Health Organization and Alzheimer's International. So they are fairly robust economic numbers. But then the question is, so what can we do about it? And as we all know, uh, first of all, dementia is a collective noun, <laughs> which is a poetic way of saying it's not one disease. Um, it's a, it's a, a collection of diseases that all have, uh, in a way, um, common consequences in the brain, and that is that our higher cognitive abilities get deteriorated. So our memory, our verbal abilities, our concentration, our coordination, our spatial navigation, and so on. So these uh, somewhat poorly defined things uh, sometimes all get affected some in some cases in in, in certain uh, cases of dementia certain cognitive abilities are more affected let's say if if your memory is primarily affected you have something called amnestic type dementia and uh, perhaps your verbal skills might get affected more maybe uh, your um your um executive abilities, so your ability to focus and behave in a socially acceptable way. Uh, th 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 this is caused by frontotemporal dementia. So there are many types of dementia and they have their own, uh, they have their own pathophysiologies, their own etiologies, their own causes. 70% uh, of dementia is caused by something called Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the, the next big dementia is vascular dementia, which is caused by tiny strokes in the brain. Then there's Lewy body dementia and frontotemporal dementia and, uh, uh, and dementia in various forms of Parkinson's disease and Creutzfeldt-Jacobs disease, quote unquote, mad cow disease and so on. So there are many forms of dementia. And this is one of the problems. You have many diseases that can cause similar problems. And sadly, for very few of these diseases are there reliable treatments. However, there are about 5% of dementia cases that are absolutely treatable. Sometimes structural changes in the brain that surgeons can go in and, and fix. Sometimes there are deficits of certain vitamins and essential nutrients um, that uh, cause dementia. And if we pick up those cases of dementia early on, we can absolutely treat them. So about five, maybe 10% of total dementia cases can be treated and stopped and sometimes even reversed. And, you know, if, if, if it were for nothing else, that would, would be a good argument to screen early on, because even if you can only cure five to 10% cases, you can only cure those if you pick it up early on. Yeah, and, you know, knowing uh, knowing upfront cannot harm, and uh, having the best picture, most realistic one, uh, offers you a plethora of options. If you if not curing, then at least knowing that these people, I'm guessing, but uh, you can correct me, correct me if I'm wrong. Knowing that these people are, have a condition can certainly engage their loved ones, families uh, around that and, uh, and, you know, prevent some harm happening to them and, and so on. So uh, definitely uh, like screening has its own um, value that is very high, even without, uh, of course it is, uh, it would be great if you could cure it as well, but screening has its own value. And what uh, so uh, just, just an, addendum, uh, even in those 95 to 90 percent of cases where there isn't a definitive cure, a definitive treatment, there are treatments. Alzheimer's disease, the, the most common form of dementia resulting in about 70 percent of all cases, has four, let's say nowadays five, registered treatments for it. And these treatments are not cures. They don't cure patients, but they definitely improve quality of life and they prolong healthy years. They add two, maybe three uh, years of a higher quality of life to not just the patients, but to their families. But these treatments only work if you start them early on. 
in the later uh, phases of Alzheimer's disease, these, these treatments are rarely effective. And that's why it also makes sense to screen. So even if you can't treat it absolutely, even if you can't cure it, you can still help patients with the, with the appropriate treatments. All right, uh, but if, taking that this problem is so prevalent and um, that there are many mm, dementia studies in the EG world, uh, why was that problem not solved and, and how come that, that, uh, that you came and, and offered your solution, in your opinion? Yes, yeah, that's a very good question, actually. So if one goes back uh, to the EEG literature, you can find references to all kinds of dementia going back to the 1950s, actually. Because in the 1950s, EEG was the only game in town, right? <laughs> if you wanted to look at the brain in the 1950s, well, you, you could crack open the skull, right? But the patients object usually when you want to do that. So then the other option was EEG because x-rays x -rays don't really help. And they noticed a bunch of interesting things. The most uh, robust observation in dementia in terms of EEG is the so-called slowing of brain waves, that the, the dominant frequencies observed in the EEG signals tend to shift from higher to lower frequencies. Let's say you get less beta waves and more theta waves. The alpha peak, so the uh, region on the EEG spectrum that denotes the higher powers in the alpha band gets downshifted from, let's say, 11 or 10 hertz at its peak to maybe 9, 8 or 7 hertz. So these were all observations made back in the 1950s already. Uh, so the problem is not whether or not dementia in its various forms uh, objectively alters EEG signals. The question is, can you make use of this observation in a way that's practical in everyday clinical practice? And the answer up to, we think, the last 10 years or so was no, for a variety of reasons. One of these reasons are technological. If your EEG takes up half of a room, that's not a practical means of detecting dementia early on because you can't hand such a device to every GP out in the countryside. And then if the recording takes an hour or two to do and you need experts to do it, that also is not compatible. Secondly, if you need experts to interpret the data visually for every patient, that also isn't good. Well, if we had an army of neurophysiologists numbering in the thousands in, in, in every small country that they would do this manually, maybe it would be doable, but it isn't doable. So, and then, you know, sometimes these observations uh, are made. So, okay, I can detect in most cases of dementia certain changes, but then the question is, how specific is this for dementia? How um, how sensitive is it for this disease? So very practical questions. And if you want to approach the EEG using visual observations, the specificity and sensitivity is too low for these kinds of observations to be of any practical use. And people forget this nowadays, but the, the FFT, the fast Fourier transform, which basically every cell phone can do now, this was a high-end research tool back in the 1980s. So not too long ago, right, in the 1980s, only the most sophisticated laboratories had computers that regularly did Fourier transform of EEG data. It was very difficult to do. You had to record EEG on magnetic tape and then play back the magnetic tape. It was a, a fairly esoteric practice. I, it, it, is, it is quite uh, quite funny. And that's one of the main reasons why EEG has not been applied to in clinical practice in this neuroscientific way, because the technology just wasn't there. The EEG hardware wasn't up to the challenge. It wasn't cheap enough. It wasn't mobile enough. It wasn't non-invasive enough, it wasn't easy enough to use, then the analytic technology, the CPU power, the, uh, the processing ability of computers to crunch the number just wasn't there. But the, in the early 2000s, things started aligning for EEG. And, and, and if you look at the publications of, of EEG, 
studies in the neuroscientific li literature in the past 10 years or so, you can see that there seems to be a renaissance of EEG analytics in the last five or 10 years. In the last five years, actually, the EEG literature has had the highest percentage growth among these various technologies that can scan the brain, MRIs, PET scans, MEGs, and so on, which is interesting, uh, given the fact that EEG is a fairly old technology in its principle, of course. But because of its, uh, be, because it's inexpensive, because it's non-invasive, because it's quick, because it gives you millisecond precision, because the data can now be analyzed quickly, that's why it's, it's having this renaissance. And we wanted to ride the wave of this EEG renaissance and in a way apply ourselves to the challenge of getting uh, not just detectable markers of dementia in EEG signals, but getting markers that are specific and, and sensitive enough to be useful in clinical practice, because that's always our goal. To, to provide a tool for physicians that they can actually use and is practical for them. I think we share that part of the vision on making some uh, useful tools. Uh, so I'm going to extend on it because um, uh, you, uh, I, I have a, a great respect for what you're doing uh, in the sense of uh, uh, extending the research field into an applied field. And that is, uh, that is what uh, what, what inspires me as well. So what do you think that uh, is the future of, let's say, uh, consumer EEG uh, in general? I think EEG has a bright future, but I think the question in a way is unfair to EEG because sometimes people, I know when I talk to students, right, cognitive science students and sometimes medical students, and they ask me, you know, I, it's, it, I'm curious about EEG because it's easy to get access to, but I'm somewhat reticent to go into EEG because it seems to me like an old field. Isn't it like a bit out of date, this, these curves on pieces of paper? And I tell them that's, that's a fair question. It is a fair question, but in a sense, it is a, a question that misses the point. Uh, let's say you uh, were talking to a meteorologist and uh, you ask the meteorologist, why are you still using thermometers to measure the weather? Thermometers are an ancient technology. I mean, Galileo, uh, Galilei had thermometers 500 years ago. That's, you know, old time things. Why don't you focus on Doppler radar? That's, you know, modern. It has these big dishes and it costs millions of euros. Why don't you do that? And the, uh, the, the, the meteorologists would look at you funny. I mean, you know, of course we use thermometers because they are a distinct uh, measuring tool that measures something completely different from Doppler radar. The fact that Doppler radar costs millions of euros doesn't make up for the fact that the thermometer measures temperature and Doppler radar measures the, let's say, distribution of clouds over the surface. You can't get the distribution of clouds from the temperature, and neither can you get the temperature from the distribution of clouds. These things are correlated, of course. Usually when there's clouds, the temperatures do drop, but measuring clouds doesn't mean measuring temperature. And it's the same thing for EEG. So EEGs measure the electrical activity, as we like to say, oh, these, these are weasel words. It's not precisely that way, but EEG measures something completely different from MRIs and PET scans and MEGs, even MEGs. Uh, and it is worthwhile measuring because it is quite close to the processes that matter in the brain. It's a very direct measure of cellular activity, of electrical activity down in the brain. And that's a big advantage. The brain, after all, is an electrochemical organ. And these other tools, much more modern, very useful tools, great tools like uh, functional magnetic resonance, uh, resonance imaging and PET scan. These are miraculous tools. I'm always fascinated at what we can extract from spinning atoms. That this is, but at the end of the day, there are more indirect measures of what the brain does. Uh, and that's why I think EEG will have a long, a long future ahead of it. All right, let me extend to a bit of uh, 
uh, a recent trend. Recent trend. Um, what do you think about uh, metaverse? And is there a future of EG in metaverse, in your opinion? Perhaps. Well, I have to say that uh, the, the only thing I know about this uh, initiative of the metaverse is what I've heard people on Twitter and, and YouTube say. <laughs> I'm far from an, uh, from an expert. Um, uh, to be quite honest, at, at this stage, it doesn't seem much more than hype. I haven't seen any actual uh, applications or even how it would look. But let's say if one implemented a, uh, a virtual reality environment that uh, millions of people could share in, then perhaps, right, if you attached uh, a bit of EEG technology to it to perhaps guide uh, certain actions these characters can take in the world, perhaps that might be a good idea. Uh, and, it, uh, and I'm sure somebody's working on, on, on this as we speak. Uh, as far as I know, the, uh, as far as well, certain um, uh, defense uh, contractors are claiming the latest generations of fighter jets use uh, embedded EEGs inside of pilots' helmets to do certain things, basic things. And if that's the case, and uh, uh, piloting a fighter jet uh, uh, is a very difficult environment, very precise environment, and if they can do it there, why can't you do it in, in the metaverse? Assuming, of course, the, the, the part about the pilots is actually accurate, which is almost impossible to verify if you're not a, a spy, let's say. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Well, thanks for, for this view. I only have a couple of more questions since you're nearing the end. Um, can you tell me what is the hard part of your job? Uh, well, um, the hard part of my job is probably uh, bridging the gap of understanding between um, clinical practice, physicians who do a lot of clinical practice, and neuroscience. Uh, this, there is a high wall between neuroscientists who are involved in EEG analytics and clinical practice. It is a regrettably high wall. Uh, and these two fields don't talk to each other. The neuroscientist publishes their uh, analytical papers on this kind of mathematical processing in EEG. They discover certain biomarkers. They publish this in a prestigious journal. And they say, look, look, if you do these complex analysis on people with schizophrenia, you can differentiate this subtype of schizophrenia from that subtype, just using EEG signals in a short three minute EEG recording. And the clinician rarely reads this paper. And the clinicians who do read this paper say, so what? Do you actually expect me to do these recordings in my office? Then upload the data on my server, which I just happen to have in my office, and then manually do these processing steps in some kind of complex mathematical software package. I mean, I have to look, I have to see uh, five patients a day. <laughs> I, I, if, if I did that, I, I just do that for one patient per week. And that's a fair point. And that's why we set ourselves the task of not which is sometimes what clinicians are afraid of, not automating what the clinician does, but automating what the neuroscientist does. And we're, do, we're doing exactly the opposite of what some people are afraid of. So we're not, we do not want to automate the clinician's work, but we do want to automate the neuroscientist's work. Uh, and I have to say that the neuroscientists are much more understanding of that, which is what, uh, which is what uh, makes me happy. And what we've spent three years on is to create a completely automatic processing pipeline for EEG data that takes in these noisy, uh, 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 glitchy uh, EEG signals coming from uh, uh, a mobile EEG device uh, that was used in haste by a nurse that has seven different things that she needs to do at the same time, and a patient that might not be as cooperative as a subject in a neuroscientist lab. And then these signals, real life signals, need to then be pre-processed in such a way that they're still useful. 
And then when they are pre-processed in such a way that they're still useful, then a robust analytical process needs to be applied that can extract biomarkers that are specific and sensitive enough for dementia detection that they can actually add useful information to the clinician. And after three to four years of very detailed work, I'm happy to report that we think we've uh, succeeded uh, in, a, in a, of course, a limited sense. Nothing is perfect. Our device doesn't have 99% specificity and sensitivity, but it does have about 95% specificity and about 60% sensitivity when it comes to detecting dementia early on compared to, of course, psychometric testing. Uh, and this is done on short five minutes of uh, EEG with eyes open and eyes closed. And the analytic process is robust to anything but the most egregious errors in EEG recording. Uh, I have to say that half of the recordings that we can process would be excluded by a standard neuroscientist when they're doing data processing. But a standard neuroscientist can afford to have students in their lab. Uh, we cannot, we have to work with every patient. Well, that, um, that whole thing sounds very complex, but I know that you're doing a great job uh, because we chatted a few more times in private. But can I ask uh, what gives you uh, pleasure about your job? Well, honestly, when, when, uh, when I get to look at a new step of EEG analytics and I get to mark what our developers did right and what they did wrong, that gives me the most pleasure. <laughs> but that, that doesn't get, generate a lot of pressure, uh, pleasure for our developers. Uh, that, uh, that's, uh, that's a small joke. <laughs> honestly, uh, in, in my day-to-day -day work, it, it, the, the, the greatest uh, satisfaction, I would say, uh, uh, is... Uh, knowing that something we spent five plus years developing is now slowly going to start leaking into clinical practice. That I think is the, the greatest um, professional satisfaction. Um, and um, uh, we know that this is the case because uh, a few months ago we attained a CE marking. That's the European Union's equivalent to the FDA, right? So CE marking as a class one medical device uh, to be used for early dementia screening. Uh, and that uh, milestone, a major milestone for our company uh, marked the transition period from pure research into tentative, careful clinical practice. Uh, and then hopefully, if everything goes well, in a few years, uh, we'll, be, we'll begin more regular uh, clinical work. All right. Uh, well, good luck with, the, with that. Uh, I have only one question at the end, uh, and uh, this is uh, unrelated to uh, EEG. Um, are, are startups still cool? And uh, can you, as a startup founder, confirm or disconfirm that... Uh, Co-founders are still rock stars of, or this shifted in the last few years? Well, um, maybe, but not medical startups, I have to say. You have to be uh, a special person to, uh, to, uh, to go into medical, the, the medical startup environment. And in the, in the medical field, most startups are actually spin-offs from large pharmaceutical companies. We're, we're not. So we decided to do the, the, the more difficult path of starting on our own. Uh, it's difficult to say whether or not we're, we're rock stars. We certainly aren't, maybe other people are, but there are advantages, right? If you're a startup doing some small thing for the automotive industry and you manage to you know, save them 5%, you do make a lot of money, but uh, people don't really care about what you're doing. And, People do care what we are doing uh, because a lot of people have dementia. A lot of people know someone who has dementia and they're always very grateful, very supportive of what we're doing. And that's what keeps us going. Uh, but I also have to say something else and uh, we haven't touched on this. A startup, and we're still a small startup. There's, you know, there are fewer than 10 employees in our, in our company at present. 
Uh, a small startup needs, needs a lot of support uh, from a variety of, of fields, from the medical field, from experts, from doctors, from the pharmaceutical industry, from the regulatory authorities, and so on. Uh, but they also need friends. And, and I have to say that M Brain Train was a, was a good friend to Brain Trip. It still is. Hopefully, it will still be after this, this uh, interview. Um, and uh, uh, I can honestly say that we couldn't have done it, we couldn't have made it so far had M Brain Train not supported us very generously with, with advice, with assistance, with hardware. Uh, and uh, we clicked in a, in, a, in a very productive way, I think, and uh, we're all looking forward to an even more productive relationship in the coming months and years. Thank you very much, Yuri. Uh, this was most uh, amusing for me, hopefully also for, for our listeners. I wish you good luck and I think you're, you're doing great, uh, great things. Thank you. Yuri. See you next time. Bye-bye.